Very good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to our thematic webinar on studying life sciences and health sciences in the UK. A uh, very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I know it's become really, really hot in India and you've probably had a very long day in your school or college. Um, so I really appreciate all of you joining us today. So this is your chance to really sit back, relax. Um, listen to the wonderful panel that we have and get all your questions answered. Um, so today's thematic webinar, as you know, this is a series of um, webinars that we do. Today is our final one for this financial year, and uh, we're proud to bring to you a session on, stud on studying life and health sciences in the UK. Um, we have three fantastic universities here with us um, who uh, will sort of, you know, take their time to answer all your questions today and, and to also tell you a lot about the opportunities that are available uh, for you to study these subjects in the UK. So if you have specific questions about studying the subject or specific questions around uh, going to the UK in general and you know working there or studying there and also if you have specific questions about the courses that the universities will talk about all of that can be answered here. So what you need to do is you see a small Q&A box on your screen. It's a small bubble with a Q&A on it with a question mark on it. Click on that, put your question in and I'll make sure that the panel answers that. So we'll either answer it in the Q&A box or I will ask the panel and they will answer it um, during the session today. We're going to see three quick presentations and we're going to spend the rest of the time answering your questions. Um, so I hope that's going to be useful for you. So really do you know pile in all the questions. I promise we'll get to all of it. Um, without further ado, let me just quickly um, introduce our wonderful panel today. We have from Goldsmiths University of London, Jake Longley, who is International Student Recruitment Manager. Welcome, Jake. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have Dr. Debbie Morais from the University of Warwick. Debbie is Director of Postgraduate Education at WMS. Welcome, Debbie. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we also have Renee Lee from the University of Reading. Uh, Renee is Program Director in BSc Biological Sciences. Welcome, Renee. Thank you for joining us today. Um, that's actually Dr. Debbie and Dr. Renee. <laughs> so um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we also have Ludo from uh, University of Reading. Thank you for joining us today, Ludo. Um, great. So I can already see the questions piling in. Um, great, so that's a good start already. So I'm going to kick this off with uh, Jake. Jake, if you want to share your screen and um, we'll see the first presentation for, from Goldsmiths. Feel free to put your questions in while the presentation is going on. Like the question. If somebody else has asked it and you have the same question, you can ask questions around the course, around the subjects of life science and health science, about studying in the UK, anything you want really. This is your opportunity. So welcome, Jake. You're off. Yeah, you're good to go. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for coming today and thank you for having me. So my name is Jake Longley and I'm the International Recruitment Manager at Goldsmiths and I help students from India to come and study at uh, Goldsmiths. My contact details are on the screen um, here at the moment, so obviously feel free to take a screenshot, but don't worry if you don't get this now, they'll come up again at the end as well. Um, but obviously, if, if you've got any questions, I can answer them today, but outside of this meeting, feel free to get in touch. Um, either through email or through WhatsApp, things like this, and I'd be really happy to hear from you. OK, let's uh, get moving. So, so some quick facts about Goldsmiths. We were founded in 1891 and we joined the University of London in 1904. I think we were the fifth or sixth university to join this prestigious group. As a group of 17 universities based in London that includes UCL, King's College London, London School of Economics and lots of wonderful universities like this. We're a single site campus in the heart of South East London. We have 10,000 students that come from 140 different countries all around the world and we're considered to be one of the UK's top creative and political universities. Across the programmes we offer, we have a real interest in creative arts, media, entrepreneurial business, computing, psychology, social sciences and humanities. And through what we've taught, a lot of our alumni have gone on to have some really quite amazing careers, some being sort of world famous and others having really amazing careers inside programmes like uh, subject areas like psychology and things like this. So, like I said, we're based in southeast London. We're in an area called New Cross. You can see our campus is the orange logo um, where it says Goldsmiths Campus towards the bottom right of this map. This map just shows basically central London and the area though where we are. But where we are, we have two train stations, New Cross Gate and New Cross. Both of these go into London Bridge, which is in the centre of this map. And if you travel from our campus on one of these two trains into London Bridge, it will take literally nine minutes. 
It's one stop on the train, super easy to do. But if you want to get from our campus, say to Selfridges, which is next to Oxford Circus to the top left of this map, a sort of very famous department store, it's going to be about 33 minutes door to door. Similarly, if you want to get to places like Shoreditch, which is a really fun, fun place to go out in the evening, it's 15 minutes direct from one of our two train stations in our area. So like I said, it's really easy to get around to get from our campus into central London and see all the sites around there. Like I said as well previously, we're a single site campus. That means every building you need to study in or to do your work or to meet other students is inside that thin orange line at the bottom of this photograph. So everything from our psychology labs through to our lecture theatres, our library, student support services is all inside there. You can see on this photograph as well, we've got some um, accommodation buildings, some are right on the campus, some are just opposite the campus, and then the final two, one is a 10 minute train ride away and one is a 10 minute, no 15 minute bus ride away, but it's all really easy to do, really close by, uh, so it's really um, convenient to get to the campus from wherever you're staying. And with this photograph as well, you can see just how close we are to central London. You can see the two train lines kind of going into the city centre. If you were to walk from the campus to the city, it would take about an hour and a half. But like I said earlier, if you use those trains, five to ten minutes and you're there. OK, so today I'm going to speak about psychology at Goldsmiths. I'm going to speak about a couple of the programmes that we offer, but give you an idea of what it is we do inside this area. We consider to be inside the, the top 150 in the world for psychology, and also we're joint first in the UK for research intensity in psychology as well. Our courses from cognitive neuroscience to animalistic psychology are both accredited and quite diverse. So we do offer quite a range of programmes in this area, but you can see from um, what's on the screen now, we offer, we have kind of specialisms inside clinical psychology, cognitive neuroscience and forensic psychology and areas like this. But obviously there's quite a few programmes here, but I'm actually going to touch on just three of these today. I'm going to kind of show, try and show you a pathway from undergraduate through to postgraduate, but also another option as well in our MSc Psychology Conversion programme. So to begin with the undergraduate programme, the BSc Psychology, this degree offers a scientific approach to the study of human behaviour, giving a broad understanding of psych psychological theory and also research. It helps to develop your understanding of the process influencing how people, um, the process is influencing how people think, feel, behave and interact. By the end of this programme, you'll understand the reasons why people think, feel and behave the way they do. You'll also be introduced to the core foundations of psychological thought. You'll get to grips with statistics and also learn how to design and conduct experiments using industry standard software. On a program like this as well, we've got well established links with employers and we also offer a mentoring scheme. So this is where you'll be paired with a member of academic staff who support your psychological thinking and enhance your employability skills as the programs go on. The, the academics that we have on this program and across the programs that we offer at Goldsmiths are experts in their field and you'll have the opportunity to get involved in the world class research taking place in the department. We also offer a wide range of specialist modules on topics as diverse as the paranormal, paranormal magic, the use of psychology um, in a legal setting and how we can best treat addiction in areas like this. The BSc psychology programme has um, sort of three different pathways as well, including um, clinical psychology, cognitive neuroscience and also forensic psychology. So depending on what area you want to study and how you want to sort of specialise maybe in a career or at postgraduate level, you can choose these optional modules, these optional pathways and push the degree into that area that you want to go to. When you get to master's level study, or if you're thinking about this now, we have a program like the MSc Foundations in Clinical Psychology and Health Services. This program is intended for graduates in psychology or related disciplines who are interested in progressing to careers in the health professions as, for example, practitioners or researchers or managers. It's also for current health service professionals with a degree in psychology or, again, related disciplines who wish to enhance skills and knowledge in the areas covered by this program as part of their continuing professional development. This program will also help equip you with an up-to-date knowledge of relevant theory and practical issues in UK mental health services and will help to develop the knowledge and skills necessary to undertake research and development in academic and healthcare settings. Now this program has two pathways available, so applied clinical, uh, excuse me, applied clinical psychology and research in clinical psychology. So just to explain these two, the first one, so the students who take the applied clinical psychology pathway complete the following module, which is professional practice. 
Um, this, the key feature of this module is a 35 day work placement in a setting relevant to clinical psychology. This pathway would suit students with limited work experience in areas related to clinical, clinical psychology and also who would like to develop a career in a more applied setting. Now, as part of this programme, we've got some really wonderful links with lots of NHS services across London and other services like this. So we can um, we sort of help set, set you up with that work placement so you can get the best experience you can whilst you're studying with us and get that experience that you may desire. If you choose the research um, in clinical psychology pathway, you complete the following modules on the screen now. So advanced quantitative methods, applied research design in clinical psychology and statistical data analysis project. So these modules are designed to provide students with more advanced research knowledge and skills. So this pathway would suit students who would like to progress to further postgraduate study, maybe particularly a PhD where re uh, research skills are key. And also um, maybe for those students who already, already have substantial work experience in areas related to clinical psychology psychology and want to further their research skills. Now to go a slightly different way, we have this new program, the IMSC Psychology Conversion Program. So this innovative um, MSc program is aimed at students who have not studied psychology before and it will equip them with the knowledge and qualifications necessary to start their training for a career in professional psychology. Now the entry requirements for this program is you need a bachelor's degree in any subject, but you need to have the equivalent of a UK first degree. So this is a score of around 70% or higher. Um, the aim of the program is to provide to students who do not have a first degree in psychology, a conversion route into further professional training in psychology in a wide range of uh, wide range of areas, including clinical psychology, educational psychology, forensic psychology, and academic and research careers. This program also covers the basic elements of the first degree in psychology, including theoretical and practical modules related to um, obtain graduate basis for chartered membership of the British Psychological Society. So like I said before, this program is for students who have not studied psycho psychology before, and we can help get you ready and get, um, to go out there and find that career in psychology that you want to do at master's level. Just to give you an idea of some of the facilities that we have at Goldsmiths as well. Um, so equipment and um, uh, like like facilities that you'll be using on the programmes. So the top left of this photograph is from our Forensic Psychology Behavioural Studies Lab. On the top right, we have our eye tracking lab. So looking at where sort of eye movement goes through certain studies and tests. We also have our EEG lab, so monitoring um, brain activity and then similarly we have a whole infant lab so looking at um, child psychology but this particular photograph is from the EEG lab inside the infant lab so this particular photograph is um, an EEG sort of headset that we use um, when studying say children as young as two and understanding their response to certain situations and drivers and things like this. So finally, I just want to sort of wrap up talking about sort of careers that come from studying psychology at a place like Goldsmiths. So throughout our degrees, you'll receive um, thorough training in the design and evaluation of research, statistical analysis, and the use of specialist psychology relevant software. In addition, you'll develop the following transferable skills. So critical thinking and analytical skills, the ability to look at issues from different perspectives, reflection skills, self-motivation, planning and organizational skills, and then oral and written communication skills. Students from our programmes using these skills then go on to a broad range of careers and future studies such as clinical psychology, broadcasting, media psychology, advertising, market research, consultancy, research psychology, occupational psychology and then criminal and forensic psychology as well. Um, our graduates also work in a wide, wide range of settings from schools to hospitals, from broadcasting to banks and in both private and uh, state sector jobs. So I want to thank you for sort of joining us today. Hopefully, obviously, it's quite a sort of brief look at some of our programmes, but hopefully it gives you an idea of what we look at in some of our programmes, the areas that we kind of specialise in and some of the options you have. Um, again, here's my contact details on the screen. So feel free outside of this presentation, um, outside today to contact me if you like. And also, I'd recommend going to our YouTube channel, so Goldsmith London. There's some really great um, videos on there, um, including our students, but also there's tours of like the psychology department, and it shows you exactly what we do um, at Goldsmith. Goldsmiths. So thank you uh, for joining today. That is my section done. Great. Thank you so much, Jake. Um, there are quite a few questions coming in um, from well, one particular student, uh, Kuldi, but um, I do want to kind of quickly take, well, I think a lot of that has been answered. Uh, but if I just request the panel to come on video again, um, there are uh, questions around and these. A, a, a lot of them have been answered already, but I still, Jake, I'll give you a chance to answer because you were presenting, of course. 
Um, but there are a few questions around um, what kind of IB subjects and requirements do you have? And let's not just talk about IB. IB. Let's talk about um, the Indian boards or the general kind of requirements that you have for studying these courses. Um, are there are there any special entrance exams that you expect the students to take? Are there any tests which are separate from their uh, board exams or their you know school or college results? Um, so if you want to just quickly talk talk us through that. I'll come to the after you. Yeah, of course. So for entry to Goldsmith's bachelor's degrees, we don't require any extra exams or any uh, tests like this. Firstly, for the IB, we ask for 33 overall with three high level subjects at 655. For the Indian Standard 12th, we ask for a score of 80% or higher. Now, for both of these, we don't normally say what subjects we want you to have them in, but for a program like psychology, I would recommend if you can have a psychology module, that'd be really good. But maths is super important as well. Just to kind of confirm and take a step back for a second we do ask students to have the equivalent of a GCSE in maths as well so for Indian students that would be the standard 10th like a, um, a maths um, a qualification at standard 10th level oh you're muted <laughs> sorry you're still, you're still muted. muted I think you're still muted yeah of course I mean, You're now back. I think it's a Dean's uh, event finally since I've been <laughs> muted and talking. Uh, no, there was a question around whether we need maths um, in our final year. Um, so to study a bachelor in psychology at Goldsmiths, does the student need mathematics in the 12th? And that's a yes, Jake. Yeah, I would recommend it. I mean, we don't normally say what exactly what qualifications we need, but I would definitely recommend maths just because the, the amount of st uh, statistical data you'll be looking at will be very beneficial. Wonderful, got it. Um, Debbie, can I come to you? Do you want to sort of anything different in your insti institution or is it similar on, on similar lines? No, I think it's, yeah, I think it's similar. I don't think that there's anything else. There's nothing specific. There's recommendations depending on the different courses, but yeah. Brilliant. Renee, do you want to? Hi there. Um, yeah, it's pretty similar in our institution. Um, I would actually refer to Ludo, who is actually around today because he has a better idea of the international requirements. But, you know, more yeah. specifics I can try and answer as well, because we do have quite a few different programs in the health and okay. life sciences. OK, brilliant. Ludo, I think, is on all is sort of answering in the chat anyway. But Ludo, if you want to add anything here, please do so. Yeah, thank you. I'll be super quick. So yeah, absolutely. We do follow uh, uh, in terms of our CBC, ICC state boards. We do accept as a British level equivalent. So uh, following basically what other universities are, are doing in this sense. So yeah. Brilliant. Um, there's a few questions around. OK, so there are some questions around uh, accommodation. I'm not going to go into that right now. You, I think if the universities wanted to share the links where their accommodation options are available. Please do have a look at that. Uh, we don't need to really go into the details of that. It, it really depends on what is sort of suitable for the students. So have a look at those links. Um, what I do want to get into is. Um, is the UK completely open? Is everything happening physically now? Are all your classes face to face now? Or do you still provide options of studying remotely? Um, so there are two ways of looking at it. One is do you have kind of remote online courses or classes around these subjects A or B? Do you have typically face to face classes which you are now offering um, online still? So um, Jake, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you first and I'll, yeah, I'll do the round, round robin. Of course, yeah, everything, um, all of our classes are on campus. Um, so we're, we're back face to face. Um, so what we sort of do, we we ask students still to wear face masks on campus. It's, it's not a re legal requirement around the UK anymore or in, in England. Um, I'm not sure about the other <laughs> the countries that make up England. I think we're all the same. Um, but yeah, we ask for face masks on campus. We have a one way system in place. There's hand sanitizer stations everywhere. Um, but yeah, where um, everything's kind of currently OK, so we're, we're back on campus. If students can't make it to the country um, or they do get COVID whilst they're studying with us or things like this, if they can't attend classes, um, students can join online, but all of our programs are delivered face to face. We don't normally do online delivery. It's just in times like this where we can switch to that if we need to. Brilliant. If there's anything different, um, Debbie or Renee, that you'd like to mention, please do come in. I think just to say that, yeah, 
it's cha ever changing. So you know, whatever we say now sure. does depend on the guidelines of, of yeah. the country. But our intention is always, if we can do face to face as much as we can, we will be doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can add to that as well. I mean, um, Debbie and Jake is absolutely right. Um, a lot of things have gone back face to face. However, we do take into consideration if you are shielding, for example, or somebody is immunocompromised, Fair we enough. do have things like screencasts and blended learning so that they can still get involved with the learning. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can I just check with a thumbs up that the duration of your master's courses are one year for life sciences and health sciences. Uh, do you also have two year courses? We don't. No. We have one year course one full year. time or part time, but an international oh. student would need to be doing it full time. Well, full time. So. Exactly. And it would be three years for the bachelors. I think that's, that's standard. <laughs> OK, great. Uh, there was a question on duration. There are some questions coming in on job opportunities after doing their masters in very specific subjects, but I'll come back to that. Um, after the next presentations, I think Debbie, you're up next. Uh, but keep the questions coming, everyone, while Debbie shares the screen. Um, these are really interesting questions, uh, especially around, you know, whether you are eligible to study these or not, de depending on your sort of past subjects and your uh, sort of, uh, you know, academic history, etc. Um, the panel are really well placed to answer those questions. So, yeah. And yeah, we can see your screen. <laughs> you're up. Perfect, thank you. So just to remind everyone, uh, my name's Debbie Murray and I'm the Director of Postgraduate Studies at Warwick Medical School. And we do have um, our my, my colleague from Warwick here in the recruitment side who will be able to answer anything if, if I can't. Um, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about Warwick first. So it's quite a modern university. Um, when you're looking at some of the others that were established years and years ago, we were only established in 1965. But we've really been one of the top UK universities um, for a long time. And um, we've consistently been ranked as one of the top 10 universities in the UK. So we're also now ranked as one of the top 100 universities. Um, and I think that that just gives you an idea of, of what we're trying to achieve um, at Warwick. We are a research intensive university um, and that means that you're going to be taught by the experts in the field, the people that are really doing the work and, and that have a passion for that. So then just to go to a little bit of where we are, um, Although we call the University of Warwick, we're not in the town called Warwick. Um, we're just a little bit south or oh, in the southwest of the city of Coventry, which is in the Midlands. So we're really in the middle of England. Um, and that means that we are in the middle of the country, so you can travel around the UK really easily um, and you can get to Birmingham by train. It's only about 25 minutes and London's only about an hour by train. Right, so the University of Warwick is, is a campus based university, which means it's not in the middle of a town, really. It's on the outskirts and we have a population of 27,000 students from 145 nationalities. Um, although we do call it um, a single shared campus as well, we do have some placements in some areas, especially in our medical school, um, that students will go out into the trusts, go into the hospitals um, in the surrounding areas. But generally, all of our teaching is done on the campus um, and, and it depends on where on the campus you are. Um, this also helps with cross pollination of ideas. So, you know, we can we can use things from one department to another. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later as well. 
that interdisciplinarity is really important for us. Um, and so we have a very good working relationship specifically between our School of Life Sciences and the Medical School. And if you look at our map here of, of the university, um, you'll be able to see that this top part here, we, we, we're up on the hill um, where we have the, the, the Gibbet Hill campus and that's for the medical school and for the life sciences. And in this medical school or in at, at the Gibbet Hill campus, we have various um, world renowned research groups that are working there. Um, so just at um, on that campus, we have the, the Warwick Clinical Trials Unit, where we conduct trials on cancer, emergency and critical care, maternal health and pain and rehabilitation, and um, quite a lot of health sciences research, specifically in global health and obesity and mental health. We also have biomedical science labs, which focus more on microbiology and infection, um, cell development and translational and experimental diet. Um, medicine. And we have um, in life sciences, we have research centers for antimicrobials, for crops, industrial biotechnology and biorefining, environmental systems, integrative synthetic biology and systems biology and infectious disease epidemiology, or very long words there. But it just gives you an idea of, of the interdisciplinarity, I think, and that's just on that top part of the campus. Um, you can see this new building that we have, um, the IBRB, we call it, um, and this is being built very recently, and it really shows the interdisciplinarity um, of, of our staff. Across the university, we've still got other research groups that um, also are multidisciplinary and, and that we are part of. So we have the Cancer Research Centre, the Institute for Digital Healthcare, the Warwick Centre for Global Health, um, and then the Institute for Global Pandemic Planning, which is one of those very current and topical um, institutes that have grown out of this um, pandemic. And it focuses on mathematical epidemiology, public health, and behavioural science, so bringing that all together. Right, so at um, WMS, as we call it, so the Warwick Medical School, um, I'm going to focus on, on our courses there because they're the ones that I'm most familiar with, um, and I don't have that much time, but we have undergraduate offerings, um, a graduate entry medical degree programme, and a variety of postgraduate courses. So I'm going to focus on the ones that are more likely to to attract international students. And those are the ones that are in orange there. But I'm happy to take questions on any of the others as well. So let's get started then with the first one, our Masters in Public Health. Um, and this is an interdisciplinary degree. It draws on the expertise across a wide range of subject areas and we try and explore the complexity of public health issues in the UK, but also internationally. So the course is really aimed at people that want to pursue a career in public health. Um, those that are currently involved in the practice of public health um, or if you're working in health promotion and you want to sort of get that degree behind your name. And then if you are looking for membership in the UK Faculty of Public Health, we've mapped our curriculum to that and you'll be able to do the exam very easily. We have quite a lot of choice here. We have um, core modules that you have to do that are part of public health generally in the world um, and the curriculum there. But then you get to choose three of 10 possible optional modules. You can choose a defined pathway. So we have three pathways that we show you how we feel they can fit together um, and either an academic public health one, a global health one or a health services pathway, which would probably lead more into a PhD, really. Um, and then you can choose your research projects tailored to your uh, your interests. We also have um, some innovative uh, modules here. So one, for example, is the Pathways to the Public Health Workplace. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later as well. But this will actually give you an opportunity to have a placement um, in the area of public health 
and it could be internationally or in the UK, and you'll have a three month placement there. We're also really proud of our MPH um, that it has been ranked third in the UK and 12th in the world. Um, and you can um, see that uh, there's a link there and you'll be able to go and look at more information if you would like to see that. The second one I wanted to talk about was our health research um, MSc. And this one is where you can really get yourself ready to start working towards a PhD. Um, this is really most likely what people will be doing after this, or if you want to be involved in um, quality research as part of your, your practice in healthcare. It um, enables you to learn the skills to conduct your research. And so we have um, some specific core modules that you'll be doing there looking at specific research methodologies or a range of research methodologies, really. And then we have a really wide range of optional modules here. And the reason why we do this is because you can then tailor your project that you do, your research that you do, and make sure that you are getting that um, broader picture from across the university. So we don't just limit it to, to modules within the medical school. You can actually do modules across the university as long as they are related to your research that you are doing. Um, the uh, dissertation that you do is an independent piece of work here um, and you would be working under a supervisor at this stage and then you could take that possibly further to to take it onto your PhD as I said a little bit earlier. The third one that I wanted to talk about here um, was the IBR course and so this is interdisciplinary biomedical research and that beautiful building that I showed you is part of this um, as well. And this might be if you're a biologist um, that's interested in physical science or a mathematician that wants to do something more biomedical, this is the type of course that you should be doing. It's a linking of those um, and it's definitely focused on that interdisciplinarity. So you will have to complete six taught modules. Three of them are core and then you can choose from these others. And again, you can see we'll, we'll try and challenge you to not do the ones that you're comfortable with, but to do something outside of your comfort zone as well. That's not within your area of expertise where you are at this, that stage. You also here will do two lab projects. They both about three months um, and you will do it in two different disciplines. So it won't be the same type of, of research that you're doing. It might be more chemistry focused or more physics or more biological. You'll do different types of, of um, lab projects there. Our goal here is really to prepare you for your next career stage. And so there's a lot about the employability as well. And this might be for academia or industry. So we give you the opportunity to learn about both and know what you might be able to do there. We really have cutting edge labs with that new building that we have, um, and you'll be training with really the best professional researchers as well. Right. We have a variety of other courses across the university that might be of interest to you for, for health and life sciences. Um, and I can get you more information if, if that's what you're looking for. But we have in the School of Life Sciences as well quite a few um, about um, environmental bioscience, food security, the crop production that I was speaking about, um, climate change that comes into that as well. And then across the broader university, so WMG is our, our School of Engineering, is the main focus there. We have healthcare operational management. We have um, psychology as well that we heard about earlier. Um, and then one that I think I'm going to talk about a little bit later as well, or it will come into one of my um, aspects is the, oh, my mouse is not, oh, there it is, the MSc in Humanitarian Engineering, um, which is a really, it's a new and it's very much being focused on interdisciplinarity there. Um, and then, of course, we have for you to carry on once you've finished your master's, you can go on to the PhD options. 
What I wanted to just focus on a little bit more here is what I think Warwick is going to, to give you, um, and especially at the medical school and in our life sciences um, school, is that interprofessional and intercultural experience. Um, that you will get from it. And I've looked at a few examples here um, that I think will illustrate this. And, and I, I said I was going to talk about um, the, the humanitarian engineering. What we actually do with that group is for a global health module, the students from the MPH and the students from the humanitarian engineering actually get shared teaching. So you're in a classroom together you will have people that studied geography, engineering, nursing, dietetics, physiotherapy, um, you know, a variety of different backgrounds that actually come together in a classroom and we're talking about global health um, issues. And often the, or not often, what we do for the assessment there is we actually mix the groups and we'll have students from both courses in the same group doing their, their group work and their presentation. The pathways to the public health workplace um, placements I spoke about a little bit as well, um, that is in the NPH where you will work with an organization on a specific project. Um, and we have international links as well with that. So Monash University has a similar module there in Australia and we link up with their research groups and they link up with our research groups. And last year we had three um, placements from the Fijian government as well, and then obviously loads of placements from international companies or groups, organisations, charities and local authorities around the UK. Um, we have through all of our courses, professional projects and lab placements where you'll actually be working with research active academics and again doing that in an interdisciplinary way and our staff is very international. So that's me, I see I'm being there. That was just to say, if you would like to get any more information, get in touch with us. That was excellent, Debbie. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that was really comprehensive. And um, I know all of you have a lot of questions. I'm sure Debbie will have a chance to look at the questions in a bit, uh, but I'm going to request everyone to come on video again. Um, OK, there are some questions around uh, whether admissions for September 2022 are still open in UK universities. Yeah, uh, so Reading has said yes. Great, so that's a yes uh, from Goldsmiths yeah. as well and from Warwick. Brilliant, OK, everyone says yes. Um, and I don't think I'm, I'm just going to quickly um, yeah, OK, great. I'm just going to quickly say hi to Rebecca Evans from Warwick as well, because I don't think I introduced Rebecca. Earlier. So hi, Rebecca. And thank you for joining us. Um, Rebecca has been answering some of the questions in the chat as well. OK. Here's an interesting one. Um, I know we said that there are no entrance exams for these courses um, to your universities, but what if somebody does not have great academic grades? What are you looking for in a student uh, when you accept them into your courses? Is it very important to have high academic grades or are there other ways to so, sort of, you know, evaluate a student that you're going to admit? Um, Debbie, I'll come to you first. So I think that that's quite a difficult question because it, it really does vary across courses. Um, so for some of our courses, we'll have really high academic standards because they're very comp competitive. Um, for example, if you want to get into the MBCHB, you know, it is a graduate entry one, but you still need to have really good grades. Um, the humanitarian engineering one I know is, is extremely competitive as well. So I think it does really um, depend on the course. And I, I, there are certain minimum requirements and, and we can't really play around with that m much, but you can make your applications stand out more, I think, yeah. with some of the extracurricular things you do as well. Exactly. I mean, what else can they do if they don't? I mean, they have to have the minimum grades. I think that's I think that's something we need to accept. Uh, but is there anything else that you can do to make your application stand out? I think that's uh, really helpful. Uh, Renee, if you yeah. want to add anything. I, I just yes. want to, if I can just quickly say the, the one thing that I do find is make sure that you make it really bespoke 
I know we all cut and paste things into different applications, but when you get the university wrong in your in your letter or you know your course wrong, it doesn't <laughs> look very good. So be very I'm careful back from and, that. and make yeah. that clear. Yeah. <laughs> I think a sincerity is uh, important, you know, in your applications um, beyond your academic and your extracurriculars. Um, Renee, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I, I agree absolutely with enthusiasm and the motivation. Um, the personal statement is always important. We do look at that. So if you can let that shine through and, you know, any work experience or, you know, placements, internship, those things do help. Um, but in terms of undergraduates, if you miss the grade, there's always the foundation year. And I'm pretty sure a lot of universities offer a foundation year so that you can enter via the foundation year. And then after that, go on to the um, actual undergraduate program as well. OK, great. Thank you for that. Um, there are tons of questions coming in, so I'm just going to move on to the next one. Uh, Jake. Um, are, is it possible for students who come from a commerce or an arts background to study um, these kinds of courses, to study healthcare courses or life science courses. Um, I think there's a question around um, for a common student to study medicine and healthcare. There was an uh, sorry, uh, there was a question from an art student. Hold on. Uh, if they want to study nu nutrition and exercise and so MSc in those, what are we playing with here? What is possible? So for, for some of those programs, um, Goldsmiths doesn't actually offer, um, so I can't speak too directly to some of the question marks. So I'll be brief because I think the colleagues at the other universities may, be, may have a better answer for this. Okay. Um, but obviously, if you do come from a different background and you want to study, say, psychology at Goldsmiths, we do have that master's conversion program that I talked about where we'll accept yeah. any different background as long as you have a bachelor's degree and we can help you move forward with that. Um, there are um, Sorry to start again. Um, with our psychology degrees as well, we are looking for people who have studied in like a psychology related subject. Um, so if you haven't got the exact degree or like or you can't explain how it's related in your personal statement, how your previous qualification is related to what you want to study at university. Mm it will be difficult and the, the half the reasoning is we're looking for students in that subject area but the other side is you're actually competing with students um, who have exactly the right qualifications who are trying to get onto this program however just to cut this short because I, I said i'll be quick but i'm not talking quite a lot um there are different conversion programs that can help you so things like the foundation that renee um, yeah. mentioned earlier but then a lot of universities also have graduate diplomas that can help yeah. you convert to get to a master's level Brilliant. If there's anything different to add, uh, Debbie, Renee, come in. Otherwise, I'm going to jump to the next one, which is job options in the UK after doing a master's in biotech. I think, Debbie, you might be well placed to answer this one. I can see you're already typing. Uh, yeah, I was just busy typing, so I'll, I'll take that out then. Um, there are, as I said, two main options. The one is within labs, so in the academic lab, so doing research under a, a research team. Um, getting big grants and doing that and so joining in the team there would be good and um, the other option is in industry so in the pharma industry especially um, would be where, where that would be going um, so developing new medications and treatments that would be um, the, the other option and at the moment of course with viruses and the pandemic um, anything to do with testing tracing antibodies yeah. you know that's all Bias. It's very hot now. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, Renee, can I come to you for um, yeah, sure. PG in psychology? Uh, what kind? OK, so which PG psychology program has more scope? So I, I know uh, JQ spoke about psychology as well, uh, so you can come in after Renee. But um, is there a better psychology course than another one? I mean, do they all kind of have the same, um, you know, impact and future? Any, um, any advice? I don't think yeah. I have much um, experience in the psychology area um, because our school don't offer that, but I might okay. uh, revert it back to Jake probably because yeah, I yeah, think you mentioned yeah, about yeah, uh, psychology. Yeah. Yeah, Jake, um, I saw yeah, psychology in your, in your presentation. Of course, yeah. I mean, there is a difference. All the Goldsmiths programs are wonderful. All the other universities, and I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, the, the, it, it really comes down to um, so with this sort of thing, I would recommend researching the university that um, you want to study at. 
and the subject area you want to study. So Goldsmiths, we have an interest in clinical psychology, forensic psychology, and also cognitive neuroscience and areas kind of related to this. Now you may see that similar, like as, as similar subject areas across all the universities or maybe some of them, but each university does have a slight different interest inside these areas. So it's thinking carefully about what it is exactly you want to study and which way you want to move forward with that. Once you've done that as well, I mean, what I'm saying does apply to a lot of different subject areas, but I think the other thing is to maybe not think about the name of the university, step back yeah. from that and think about just the subject that you That's want it. to study. And like I said, go through the subject area, work out what it is you want to do and then how the university can best support you do that. If then that does align to the name of the university, the place you absolutely wanted to go to, brilliant. But if it doesn't, then it gives you more options and more places to think about, like maybe finding the right place that can absolutely support you. But then to sort of summarise, I don't think you can say necessarily one is better than the other in terms of like rankings or things like this. It's more about where's best for you. Yeah. And I think that's the best way to look at it. Excellent advice. Um, Renee, this one is probably more um, something that you can help on. So what are the future job prospects um, after doing a master's in biosciences or biotech, biomedical science? Is it possible to get a job in the UK? Well, that's the main oh, question. Oh, absolutely. Um, it, is, it is definitely possible. We have had students from India who have now got a job. Um, you know, these kind of degree programs, they are absolutely broad. And I think, you know, you have a lot of opportunities after yeah. you complete it. So like what um, Debbie mentioned, you know, you can work in industry, so you can go into vaccine development, pharmaceutical research. You can go into medical writing or even clinical trials, which is really lucrative at the moment in the UK. So it doesn't have to be in the laboratory. You can get involved in those sorts of things or you can go out of science, you know, into consultancy as well. So it's all about the transferable skills and also subject specific skills that you're going to get from all these courses. OK, that makes sense. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm going to actually. OK, so there's a question on how much uh, UK CAT and BMAT matters. Um, so I think uh, we're, we can answer that in the chat box because that sounds like a technical one. Um, but I'm going to now request Ren Renee to please present for Reading. And then sure. we'll come back to the remaining questions. So, yeah. Right. Let me just share my screen and explore the technology. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hoping. Um, right. So it doesn't seem to want me to put that on. Let me just uh, restart this PowerPoint. I okay. do apologize. No problem. While we wait, um, Debbie, can you answer this question around what about clinical lab technology in UK? I suppose what would you want to study to be able to do that in the UK? Do you want me to answer or shall I keep that till after? And let's OK, let's keep it. Ready. Yeah, 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 yeah. OK, OK, we'll keep it to after. Um, but we will have time for a few more questions, so do put those in. Renee, you're up. Right, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Well, good morning from the UK and good evening to everyone in India. Firstly, I would like to thank the British Council for organising this fantastic event. Um, as you know, my name is Renee and I'm a program director and um, the deputy director of admissions at the School of Biological Sciences. I'm also the school director for placements and employability. So I've seen a lot of career questions. Do keep that coming. I'll be more than happy to help. Now, this talk really is a whistle stop tour of what it is like to study a health and life sciences program at the University of Reading with a little bit more focus on undergraduate studies, but I can also cover masters and you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about the opportunities thereafter. Right, so the School of Biological Sciences is located in the White Knights campus in Reading. So this really is a bird's eye view of the university on a bright and sunny day like today in uh, the UK. And we are, of course, a campus university as well. So you can live, socialize, study all in one place. Um, we have a vibrant and diverse community and the campus is not too far away from the town center, which is also quite rich in its social and cultural offerings. 
Um, in terms of proximity, we are around 20 minutes by train to central London, so London Paddington, and we are also roughly 20 minutes by train to central Oxford, so we're quite central. And, you know, in addition, we are located in the M4 corridor. So for those of you who have not heard about that, that's England's equivalent to the Silicon Valley. So it is great when it comes to job opportunities in pharmaceutical research, biotechnology, and also the healthcare sector. Right, so the school offers a wide range of programs um, in health and life sciences, as you can see in this uh, slide here. And it really ranges from the real flexible biological sciences degree to our accredited biomedical sciences program. We also offer specialized or applied programs such as microbiology or biomedical engineering. And you know, if you've completed your undergraduate degree, we also offer um, postgraduate degrees such as the Masters in Molecular Medicine course. So it depends really on what suits you. Now, of course, who will be teaching you, whether or not you're an undergrad student or a master's student? So all our lecturers are active researchers and they are experts in a huge number of studies and in their own right. Now, for example, you have up here uh, Professor Keetan Patel. He's a stem cell expert and focuses on muscle physiology and muscle growth. So he will teach you if you are a student here in physiological biochemistry and anatomy and physiology. And in the second row, we have um, Dr. Simon Clark. He's a microbiologist and um, his research is focused on antimicrobial resistance and Staphylococcus aureus. Some of you might have heard of that. And you know you will encounter him in various microbiology modules. So in summary, you will be interacting with the movers and shakers who are at the forefront of biology research and are excited in sharing that knowledge with you. So another unique feature of our programs is the practical experience and you know practical classes form a huge proportion of you know the health and life sciences programs whether or not it's undergraduate or masters and as you know biology is a real hands-on subject so most modules come with a practical element that is either carried out in the lab or in the field and we really find that the best way to learn about a specific topic is really getting involved and actually doing it. So putting theory into practice. So this here is a picture of a practical in progress in our new teaching lab in the new Health and Life Sciences building. And this is, of course, equipped with all the individual equipments ranging from pipettes to spectrophotometers. And, you know, practicals allow for maximum exposure. So, you know, you can learn about how enzymes work by generating a standard michaelis menten curve all the way to kind of characterizing snake venom or measuring your own lung capacity. So all these are available to you if you're a student at the university. Now, some of these programs will also give you the opportunity to observe biology in its natural environment. And a lot of the products that we use in pharmaceuticals today have been isolated from those things. So you can never simulate such a complex ecosystem in a laboratory. So what we do is we take you out into the field. So we have a microbiology field course that takes you to Iceland and you can see how microbes um, adapt to extreme environments such as volcanic hot springs or you know, uh, pristine glaciers. And then you get to learn about those microbial communities and then isolate those microbes and learn about the properties that they might have. Right, so another way of applying what you have learned over the course of your degree program, regardless of whether or not you're doing an undergraduate degree or a master's degree, is a novel research project. So in Reading for undergraduates, you get an 11 week research project and that's guaranteed for all students. Of course, master's students, depending on the course that you're doing, will also have a research project. So like what uh, the other two speakers have said, you know, the research project promotes independent work and it allows you to apply what you've learned throughout your course and provide you with the opportunity to work alongside the expert in the field. So, you know, you can work in the lab or you can work in the field or you can do a combination of both. The whole point is to learn how to design an experiment, to perform those experiments and then to interpret the data that you get. 
Now, there's also other alternatives. If you don't like working in the lab, you can do other things such as computational biology, um, science communication, or carrying out a systematic literature review. In most cases, you will discover something new, whether it be big or small, and some students go on to um, become an author in a published scientific paper. So this is just a flavor of what type of research may be available to you as an undergraduate or a master's student. You know, you can investigate how cancer spread, for example, whether or not it's random or it's directed by working with Professor Phil Dash. And you, you can approach that from many different angles, ranging from evolutionary angles to molecular biology. So, you know, some students can be involved in interpreting a 3D multi-channel image or generating it by using different dyes. So this is something that you'll experience as a student, whether or not, as I said, as an undergraduate or a master's student. Now, you can also look at things like genetics and the developmental programming of obesity with Dr. Diane Salea. Now, his work involves the overexpression of what we call the fat mass and obesity associated gene or the FDO gene. And this is done in mice and he can look at, you know, the increased potential for um, adipogenic differentiation that leads to obesity by working on this particular gene. Right, so moving on from research projects, I'm going to talk a little bit about placements and work experience, because when you come to university, it's not just about, you know, honing your academic skills. And we all know that the job market is getting really competitive, so even more so today. So in order to succeed, you know, students will require experience and skills. And at, in my position as the director of placements and employability, I've spoken to numerous employers across the UK and the tide is indeed changing. So what they're looking for, aside from just academic excellence, is the real world experience. So here at the School of Biological Sciences, we put a lot of emphasis on transferable skills, you know, placements and work experience. So as a student in the school, you can take a, a short placement, such as a summer placement, which is normally three to 10 weeks long, or a year long placement, which ranges from nine to 12 months long. And you know, by carrying out these placements, you will be given the opportunity to test drive a career of your choice before even committing to that career. And then you can also apply the soft and hard skills that you have in the real world. So as you can see, this is a map of um, showing where our students have gone for their placements. You know, they have in fact traveled across the globe. We had a student carrying out a biomedical engineering placement in Silicon Valley in California and another student carrying out um, some cancer research in New Zealand. And locally, as I've said before, you know, we are in a prime location when it comes to jobs and placements because Reading and its surroundings um, are, you know, perfect for it because we have a large number of companies such as GlaxoSmithKline, Sanofi, Syngenta, um, right on our campus and next door is the Royal Berkshire Hospital and we also have Microsoft in Reading. So they are all a stone's throw away and are, they are very keen in recruiting our students. So I'm just going to show you one or two examples of what work placements are like. So we have here Chloe and she's an, our alumni now. She worked in GSK for her placement year. And basically after that, she went on to complete her PhD in Edinburgh Uni University. And then she's now back as a senior scientist in GSK. Um, we also have Paula who then went on to do a um, summer placement in France. And she's now actually a PhD student um, who is working on adipose tissue remodeling in obesity in um, the University of Cambridge. And then we have Charin Sangira here, and she did her summer placement in GSK, which is something that we have in partnership with GSK. And she's now a anal analytical scientist in Matt Farm. So as you can see here, these are just a few success stories. Um, you can have a look at our Instagram page over here at SBS Placements to find out more about those careers and placements and our students. Right, so I know that there are a few questions about careers today, so I'll quickly breeze through this so it gives you a bit of a flavor. Um, as a student in health and life sciences, regardless of the programs that you take, there are a number of career opportunities after you graduate, so both in the lab and beyond the lab. 
So most graduates, um, as you have heard today, work as scientists in academic research labs or you know, pharmaceutical research. Um, some of our graduates have gone on to work in quality control and management of industrial processes such as vaccine production or production of food products. Um, some of our alumni are now working in forensics or biomedical scientists in hospital or governmental labs. Now, if you do not like the lab after finishing your studies, that's perfectly fine because some of our students have found their calling in sales and marketing of pharmaceutical products or scientific communication and publishing. So as a journal editor or a medical writer, and you know, there are lots and lots of emerging jobs that are looking for graduates in health and life sciences, um, such as technology transfer, um, regulatory affairs or clinical trials. So there we go. So that captures the career side. I'm going to wrap things up quickly because I can see the host. Um, so what can we offer you in Reading? Um, the School of Biological Sciences is research active, teaching focused. So you'll be taught by the movers and shakers who are happy to share their knowledge. There are several programs in the health and life sciences, as, I, as I've said before, so you can pursue your interests and develop subject specific and transferable skills. And, you know, we will provide you with career support from the get go so you can develop yourselves throughout your journey. And of course, we are a friendly environment, both our staff and students, and we will make you feel right at home because of the diversity and variety that we have. So thank you once again, and um, this is some, these are some further information if you'd like to uh, find out more, and I'm more than happy to take your questions or answer your emails if you contact me. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Renee. That was so much that you've covered. It was really comprehensive. <laughs> I know, it was perfect. It was brilliant. It was everything. So I hope that really helped everyone. Um, a very quick message to everybody uh, here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you will get an email from us after this, which will um, have everybody's emails and uh, we'll also have the presentations and the video so you can kind of catch up if you've missed anything and, and you can also pick up the conversation uh, with the, your universities um, if you would like to. Uh, and I, you know, it, it looks like that would be helpful because there are a lot of sort of specific questions to individual um, aspirations. So I'm just going to, uh, I know we're beyond the hour, uh, but I'm just going to ask a couple of questions to the panel if they want to come on video uh, before we wrap up. I think there are a few questions. There is a bit of, I think, you know, sort of doubt and concern around if I didn't have the subjects that I needed, if I didn't have the right marks, what are my options? Do I have to uh, do a foundation course? Can I do it through, I think, was it apply board? Uh, yeah, OK, through college board. Can I do a second master's and then come to you? Um, so what are the possible options really? Um, Renee, I'll come to you first. Well, I guess um, as we mentioned with the undergraduate studies, the best way to do it is the foundation year because you can come in, you can get the experience of a university and then also bring your level up um, to then engage in the actual undergraduate program. With the masters, I think it's a little bit trickier, but there are conversion courses or, you know, um, I would say um, discuss it with the university or discuss it directly with the admissions tutor because they can provide you with further information and whether or not there's some wiggle room as to whether they can come in. That's really helpful. Um, Debbie and Jake, if you want to add anything to that, please do. I, I thought I just wanted to say on that one about if you've got a postgraduate degree and you want to come and do another one, if I was looking at the application and you've got an MPH in India and you want to come and do an MPH with me, I would worry about why you would want to do the same because there are curriculums across the, yeah. the you know, the world. But if you have done a master's in health research and you now want to focus on public health, that yeah. would be fine, you know, and you do, would just need to justify that. So that wouldn't be a problem at all. Excellent, that, that, that helps. Um, there are a few questions around working in the lab and kind of practical hands on experience, uh, which also kind of ties in with the question around whether online would even work for these kinds of subjects. So um, how much of their work and their learning there is practical and how much of it is theoretical in the classroom? Um, Jake, I'll come to you first and then I'll go to the rest. 
Of course. So with um, studying things like psychology at Goldsmiths, um, there are some elements of psychology that are obviously quite heavily theoretical. So there's a lot of like looking at numbers, looking at statistics and going through sort of like data analysis. But depending on what program you're on and also what you want to achieve, there are clinical placements, there are work placements and also sort of practical um, uh, what, would, what would be the word? I was going to say experiments, but I don't think that's the right word at all. Um, sort of practical elements to the program um, where you're actually carrying out practical work and doing research, like practical research. Um, so yeah, it really depends what you're looking for, um, what program you're on, and then what options you choose as you go through the Goldsmiths programs as to what direction, whether it be practical or more theory based, yep. what it is you do. But we have a good, good range of both. Debbie, do you want to go next? I, I think what the, our university did in in when with the, the the pandemic is we looked at what courses have to be in the classroom, have to do that lab work to able, to enable them to reach their learning outcomes, and we gave priority to to spaces for those courses. So I think if if it's an essential part, it will happen. Um, you know, it will be protected in that way as much as we can. Renee, do you want to round us off? Yeah, sure. Um, biology, health and life sciences, I think they are all really hands on subjects. Um, I think you do have to learn from doing practicals or research. Um, however, like what Debbie say, you know, um, during the pandemic, we try and make best and, you know, we actually still manage to carry out some of those practicals, uh, albeit quite distanced. And um, other ways of doing it is by, you know, video and showing how it's done and um, giving students data. However, I think with the biology program, I think it's more than 50% hands on learning, I would say. Excellent. I think that's one of the biggest um, advantages of studying in the UK. So much of your learning is hands on practical, um, not just, you know, sitting in the classroom and attending lectures, though you do that as well. But it's also about learning with others, with peers. Um, and that is, you know, it's it's very different from what you what we've been used to in India. So I think uh, it's a wonderful shock in a way. Um, there are some questions around doing PhDs. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but um, just kind of a sort of a thumbs up if um, research and PhD is an option in these in in the universities here, and for students to kind of write to um, the emails that we're going to provide later to explore that further. So yes, you can study PhD across various subjects in these three institutions. So do pick up that conversation later. Um, on that note, I think we've covered all the questions pretty much. Um, but um, again, you can pick up the conversation later if we haven't. Um, thank you so much to the panelists for taking out the time for being so patient to answer all those questions from all of you. And I hope that was useful to the audience. Thank you for staying beyond the hour. We appreciate it's the weekend. So, um, you know, we let you go now, uh, but thank you. And I hope that was useful and you know a little bit more and you're better in informed now to be able to make your applications and, you know, kind of take the right steps that you need to for your future. Um, thank you, Renee, Jake, Debbie, Ludo and Rebecca. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a lovely weekend. Um, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all so much. Goodbye. <laughs>